get we're back to get more debates. We're going to pick up where we left off last time. Uh, we were having this discussion in the point mass problem. Um, where do we center the alternative? What do we do with that? So we're going to pick up on that discussion. Um, we're dealing with the point in all case. So I'll turn the page a little bit. Um, let me also tell us where we're going in this. So we're going to come back around to point mass priors. Pick up where we were last time. Um, there's also this problem right here. Uh, how do you compute, let's imagine pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, they were likelihood functions, or they were densities. And so that's your problem on uh, the whole. So you're supposed to compute a base factor in the denominator essentially looks something like this. You're going to have two, um, you're going to have three densities being added together. Your likelihood function times its prior. And so that's a little bit messy. I've written it down kind of arbitrarily. But you can think about things as densities or anything, really. So maybe densities. Maybe likelihoods. So functions of something that you want to evaluate. And so what you really want to evaluate is just this sum in the inside. Say you want to evaluate pi 1, pi 2, pi 3. Um, in our homework problem, each one of those pi 1, pi 2, pi 3s look like likelihood functions. So they're the product of something. And you would like to take the logarithm of the whole thing. You know if you add it together, got a correct numerical value, took the logarithm of it, it would be something small and manageable. But if you plug in to the inside of the logarithm function some junk that you compute numerically and it doesn't work out, taking the log afterwards is going to help you. So the idea here is you want to compute this thing right here. I always like to work on a log scale, so I want to compute a lot of that. But there's no simple simplification of all of this. If this was pi 1 times pi 2 times pi 3, and I took a lot of that piece of cake, because it just separates into the lot of pi 1 plus the lot of pi 2 plus the lot of pi 3. All things that you can compute. And so the goal right here is to compute this with only computing log pi. So you want to compute this whole thing. You don't want to compute pi, so you want to compute log pi. Let me show you how to do this. Um, you guys have all struggled with this problem over the weekend, to some degree. Is that hard? What did you end up doing? Anybody come up with some weird heuristic shortcut that it's like, well, I kind of got it to work. I think I'm in the ballpark with the number I computed. My functions look right. My base factors are all my um, posterior probabilities are all coming down except one of them is going up. Anybody have a solution or are you still spinning your wheels on it? So this is grad school. This is what it's all about. You're going to confront problems like this and you need to get solutions and get them implemented. That's the whole thing. The faster you do that, the faster you're on to the next problem. So the problem you want to solve always has like a thousand little mini problems that you think, I don't want to deal with. But that is it. So you don't have to solve the, the big thing until you do a sequence of small things. So this is what I do. So I'll just make a little note right here. And I've had this problem come up many, many times. Working with products, you always think it's harder, but you take the logarithm and it turns it into this nice form. You only have to work with the logs of things that are numerically stable, usually. So I'm going to say, Let's just make an assumption. I'm going to say the max of pi 1, pi 2, that would be a 1, 2, and 3. This is something I can compute. I can figure out which one of these is the max. So I'm going to say without a loss of generality, we're going to let that be pi 1. So w log, without loss of generality, I'm just going to give it a name. I get to know which one is bigger than all of them. So if you handed me pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, that function, I can tell you which one is bigger. How do I do that? I'm telling you I don't get to compute pi. All I get to compute is log pi's. Take the log of them. So I can compute log 1, log pi 1, log pi 2, log pi 3. Whichever one of those is bigger is 
Compile it with them. It's a monotone function. So take the log of So I can compute this and do this by working on a log schema, and that's tricky. And so that's at least my little assumption. I'm just going to give it a name. When you do this in your code, of course, it's only going to be one of them. But if you were writing automated code to take all this stuff in, you could figure it out. You just have to give it a name and work through this slightly more general. I'll just say pi one, just make my notation simpler, not come up with a pi star or the max or something like that. And so I can compute this. So I can compute pi one plus pi two plus pi three. And then divide by the max on each one. So I can divide it by the max. And I'm going to multiply by the max. Right here as well. So that's exactly the same thing. And then I'm going to take the logarithm of this. And so the logarithm of this thing is our goal. That's what we want to compute in the first place. And all I've done is a little bit of algebraic arithmetic rearrangement of everything to the log right there. They don't take too much room. And this factorizes is log of pi 1 plus the log of 1. That 1 would be one of the elements in there. And I would want to figure out which one it is by storing the index of the logarithm of the pi's that was higher, and then I would know that element would be a 1. The first one is 1 here because I said the first one was the maximum. So pi 1 divided by pi 1 is 1. This is going to be pi 2 divided by pi 1 plus pi 3 divided by pi 1. Still a lot of stuff I don't want to compute in this. So that thing I can compute that falls in my goal, I can compute that, but these are a little bit harder to compute. So this thing right here, I'm just going to rewrite it. This is log pi 1 plus the logarithm of 1 plus, and I'm going to do something and you're not going to like it first, and we're going to talk our way through it. So this is going to look like e to the log of pi 2 minus log pi 1 plus e to the log pi 3 minus log pi 1. I'm going to close my brace. Now I want to talk about these components. So all of these things, if we had 10 things in here, we would have 9 terms that was e to the log of something minus the log of something. Usually this, this looks like, and if I were staring at this, and I didn't know what the maximum was, and I didn't know anything about these values, I would say that's not a good numerical trick. Uh, simply because, yeah, I can take the log of the, these things, I can compute that, but as soon as I take this e to that thing, I'm going to be hosed. It's going to blow up in my face all over again. So I'm not going to factorize this in any particular way. What I'm going to do is I'm going to compute this term first. Log pi 2 minus log pi 1. So I can compute log pi 2, no problem. I can compute log pi 1, no problem, and I can take the difference of them, no problem. When I take E of the difference of those things, it's not going to blow up. Does anybody know why? Say it loud. It'll just it'll be a negative power. Yeah, I think it's going to be right exactly. It's some small negative power in here. But this thing right here, when I take the exponential, it's bounded by 1. So this number right here is some number between 0 and 1. And so it's not a big number. And so I was able to compute that. But remember, you take the difference first. If I ended up doing something like taking e to the log pi 2 and divide it by e to the log pi 1, that thing would explode. So I wouldn't compute it that way. Compute the difference first, then e once. So exponentiate once. Hopefully that makes some sense. Hopefully that helps. 
Um, but this is the name of the game. This, I remember thinking about this the first time in graduate school. It took me hours to come up with this. But it didn't take me days. And so um, I eventually asked a couple of people I knew around me, hey, how would you believe this? It's a weird problem. I've never had this. I have to compute the log of a bunch of PDFs. Um, never had to compute that before. Um, anyway, after some discussion, working through it, this one, I think, I think it's a useful trick. So bury that in your tool chest and take another whack at that one more problem if you didn't do this. And this should stabilize everything. Everything should um, go fine. I did have one student come to me a few years ago. I think this was three or four years ago. And said, I've been working on this for over 20 hours. And I still don't have it. Uh, and I think he wanted a concession. Like, do I have to do the rest of the problems? Yes, of course you do. So congratulations, you'll never forget when I show you this trick. So I think that's what grad school is like. You learn it and you're thankful. And you use it and you try not to forget it. And then you pass it on to your students, but only after they suck. So or else they won't remember. Okay. Um, next time we're going to come back around, I'll give you a paper on interval testing. So we'll follow up this discussion on point null testing with interval testing. It's also an interesting comparison between the name and Pearsonians and the Bayesians. I would argue in that case the Bayesian wins easily. Um, I would say in the point null test, it really depends on what you're trying to do with it. So who's the winner? I do think the Bayesian considers everything that needs to be considered so long as they've considered it and have good explanations. So I think the only rational decision um, in the, the Bayesian cases to make some subjective judgments. We'll see how imposing those judgments are. So the decisions we make have to be rational here. So hopefully we can rationalize everything. Um, for testing this problem, XIs are coming from a normal distribution. I let that be theta. Usually I say that's mu, but let's say it's theta. Sigma squared. You can see I cut it up a mu there first when I got rid of it and did it theta. The problem we're working up with is this. We've discussed this problem for a day and a half now. But this problem is still being discussed over and over and over again. Deborah Mayo and Jim Berger were just at a recent ISI conference, and they had this debate. And it's probably pretty fun for you guys to listen to, but oh my goodness, how many times do I have to hear it? So apparently more. This argument is not going to go away so long as we're testing things like this. Uh, so the prior that Bayesian uses is going to be a composition between a point mass. So this is pH naught on theta. So that's the continuous part of my prior. This is the probability of H naught right here, this part. Um, Martin kind of said during one of our conversations, maybe we could think of this as a conditional probability. And that's what I'm trying to denote. Sometimes you might want to compute it like this. So this is the density on theta given H naught. So it would be a way to do it. So the probability of H naught times this is the joint of those two things. Um, this is a good point, good time to point out. Sometimes distributions have a continuous random variable in it and a discrete random variable. And this is how the Bayesian is thinking about it. So they're putting a fire distribution on the thing they don't know, H naught. So that's what Bayesians always do. <clears throat> things you don't know, drop priors on them. There's two things you have to consider. The full space that it lives in, and then, of course, how much mass you want to put on that part of the space. Hopefully that makes some sense. This would be the alternative for the prior. And this is obviously the probability of the alternative. Now I'm calling it H1 today. Sometimes H alpha, sometimes H A, all the same thing. It's old speak, but all these but goodies and everybody still uses it. Um, our fire looks like this. Uh, I would be remiss if I could spend a little bit of time talking about the normal part of all of this. That I've imposed that my prior is this symmetric distribution centered around some point, and it has exponential day, tail decay. So parametrically, there's a lot involved right now. Why did I really do this? Um, this is the stuff 
phasing is first started with. Why do they like it? It's easy to compute. So in this case where our data is generated normal, this is the conjugate prior that means that we can at least do it all analytically. All analytically. Um, in an advanced phase class, I would expect they would spend a lot of time, a lot of time discussing alternatives to this choice. I'll give you a paper after next week that you can read through for an alternative choice that I like, one that I use all the time. Sometimes people will use this and they spend a lot of time trying to calibrate what these have to be. Really, they spend a lot of time thinking about this. I think it's okay. I like our solution better um, that we use. I like Cauchy tails right here um, for reasons I'm not going to go into. But I will give you a paper that will explain it all to you if you're willing to read through that. Um, Sierra's research deals with a problem very similar to this. Um, she's kind of doing mixture modeling with what she's doing, but for the same exact reasons that I'll demonstrate in a paper that uses Cauchy tails is the same reason we like this mixture component. Lots of discussion here, lots of things to think about. Right now, I'm going to say we do it because it's easy and maybe asymptotically you get reasonable answers. I will point out, wherever we center this thing, it's putting a lot of mass maybe right near the null hypothesis. And that's the discussion. Um, we had a quick discussion on what this should be. And somebody said last time, maybe let this be theta naught. And I think that's a big choice. So I think regardless of the parametric form of the alternative prior, centering it the null hypothesis makes sense simply because we didn't give any preference as to whether or not our alternative is leaning to the left or to the right. Just saying it's something different. So I think the only thing that makes sense is theta naught. Let's, let's imagine theta naught was zero. Maybe you say, well, maybe there is some other value that makes sense that's not theta naught. In an R case zero in this hypothetical example. Um, maybe I'd say, okay, well then what would a good value be? Maybe 10 million. And you get, no, not 10 million. That doesn't make any sense. Maybe negative 10 billion. That doesn't make any sense. So it certainly shouldn't be far away from theta naught. Unless you really did have, I have two competing choices for theta. It's either theta naught is zero or it's 10 billion. If somebody came to me with that, I'd be like, that's really weird. So, your other competing choices, this thing is super far away. So, for me, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense in the context of this problem. Um, so, I think being centered there is the right thing. The real discussion, so I'll say, in that case, our prior looks like this. So, density, centered at theta naught. There's some point mass right here in all of this. So the point mass part of all of this has height that's dictated by pi naught, this thing. And the amount of mass under this component is controlled by that. Okay, so the complement. I like using complements that makes sense. So we wouldn't want to cut something that added up to not one right here. Um, so the real question is, is what is this value right here, psi? And psi tells us something. And we're going to see this once we work through the algebra of everything. I think we need to get the answer and dwell on what that answer is and think about how these parameters influence everything. But I'll just make a note. Note. Psi um, calories. the distance we need to be from theta naught before we reject it. So I'll just give you a heads up and we'll see this mathematically in a second. If psi were infinity, um, we'd need to be infinitely far away from theta naught before we reject it. So that is a true statement. And so that has some major repercussions for us. We have to think about that. 
Some of you that was really getting into like conjugate forms, you know, Jeffrey's problem, your heart just fell to your stomach. You can't use Jeffrey's problem right here. What it would do, what Scotland just said is correct, is it would place infinite mass on the null hypothesis, and it would. So think about it a different way. What we're doing is we're giving values of theta on this continuum some amount of mass. So we're placing weights on them. So if I ended up letting psi be infinite, what it would do is it would take this prior and it would flatten it out. Be very flat. So, and how much weight would I be cutting on values of theta like over in this region if I ended up making psi really big? Not much. And eventually in the limit, I'd be cutting zero weight. And what one point in the world did I put a ton of weight on? They did not. And so, and we'll see this algebraically in a second, but really, um, in, a, in a posterior analysis of theta, if I have a lot of data, that value doesn't have much weight. And if I blow it out to infinity, it has no weight anymore. And that's kind of nice, and it doesn't influence the analysis in any like, meaningful way. Um, but in hypothesis testing, it has a different interpretation. It calibrates the distance you need to be from theta naught before you're willing to reject it. And this is the big conversation. How far would you need to be before you think it's something different from theta naught? Now, some people would say, I don't want to think about it. But that's the whole point. So that's the whole thing. So in our point flipping example, if I said, what's the, the you know, if I pulled out a quarter, I started flipping it, and I um, wanted to test the hypothesis if the probability of heads was exactly one half. That's the point null thing. Um, and it turned out, let's just say, let's say the true probability of heads was like 0.50002. Say, I don't care, that's like 0.5. So you need to quantify that mathematically. So what you don't care about. Now in physics or in engineering, I think they do make these judgments. So a lot of times they have machines that are making measurements. And we know what the machine tolerance is. This machine is good up to a certain distance. So if you wanted to test if your machine was going out of spec, you would know how to calibrate this. You'd use that information to help you pick a value right here. Okay, so hopefully that's enough subjective discussion about this. I want to get into that a little bit more. Um, we need to, I think what we're going to do is we're going to try to compute the Bayes factor. So the Bayes factor, again, and it's always this. The Bayes factor is always this no matter what. It's what I kind of love about Bayes. Always the same thing, always the same rules. Kolmogorov is still right, I'm just using probability rules. But this is just a comparison of the margins, if you will. So this is going to be the likelihood of theta. Given all of our data, um, I'm going to use XR to do everything, some of the XIs. This is the sufficient statistic. But if you didn't use X bar in your analysis, we get the same answers. So it just make everything a little bit easier. And then I need to integrate over the null prior. So that's h naught d theta. And then I'm going to integrate the likelihood function, same likelihood. And I'm going to integrate over my alternative prior, h1 theta. So I call it this. I'll write it down like that. Two different ways I can write the same thing, but it's that prior. So I've got that one here. I've got that one here, d theta. That's what base factor zones are. Keep in mind where we integrate is either in the null region or what we're comparing to, the alternative region. But the likelihood function is the same thing. And so what is this? Here's another way you can write this down. This is going to be um, px bar under the null, px bar under the alternative. So these are the margins of the data. And it's going to be a function of x bar. If you know about sufficiency, that's obvious. If you didn't, you would find that out. 
So just makes your life mathematically a little bit simpler, but we still get the same answers. So that's what the base factor is, and it's always this thing. It's a comparison of the data under the two model hypotheses. So really, what does this say? This is how much the data fits under H0 compared to how well the data fits under H1. If somebody asked me to interpret the likelihood ratio, I would give them that exact same spiel. Oh, it's how well your model fits. My model fit criterion is different though. That one is average. And the max likelihood ratio is maximum. So how well it fits maximally or on average. Um, I don't think that's a real statistical question as to which one you use. I think it changes depending on the problem. Really changes depending on how diffuse this likelihood surface is. So if the likelihood's really peaky, we'll probably make similar inferences. Uh, and it also has to do how how we smear mass across everything. If I ended up putting infinite mass out into the tails, this analysis isn't going to look very well because it's not putting mass near where I think I should be placing mass. So the closer I place mass to theta naught, the more mass I place the more this thing will look like the max likelihood ratio. So all things I want you to think about is comparisons to the other brands of statistics. Okay, so I did a little bit of math. So I figured I could work through the integrals for you. Let's just, um, before we do that, and I show you what the answers are, um, this numerator is really easy to and so this is just going to be, um, I'm going to get rid of the two pies and everything. If you want them, we could have them in there. Well, oh, let's leave them in there. It'll be good. Integral pi goes from 1 to n, 1 over 2 pi. Mm, let's do it different. Let's just kick this thing off. work with this sufficient statistic. It'll make everything a little bit um, simpler. So let's look at um, our base factor is going to be the likelihood function under x bar integral. And then I'm going to integrate over this point null. And then I'm going to do the same thing. And this is going to be a normal distribution. I'll just write down the whole thing for us, 2 pi. Uh, this is going to have some variance parameter. Square root of that is psi. e to the minus 1 half theta. I've centered my alternative at the null, which I think makes sense. And then I've got psi squared e theta. And this likelihood function, in all cases, well, let me just make sure we know where we're integrating with the null and the alternative spaces. So the operators that space is operating on are different. Um, if you want to remove theta naught from this and not actually consider it as a candidate point, that's fine. So you could do that. It has no measure at the point anyway. So putting a point mass um, to remove that point from this denominator won't change any of the math. Integrating at a point doesn't give you anything to zero. Okay, so this thing right here is just 1 over 2 pi. Square root sigma over root n e to the minus 1 half. Um, no, I don't think this one it doesn't really matter. Sigma squared over so I would choose this form of the likelihood. If you want to use the other form where you're producting everything up, the shapes look exactly the same. And you'll notice that the two pi's will cancel from the numerator and the denominator. Um, let me just ask a question. What is the numerator? So what is this integral? It's the easiest integral in the world. Well, put instead of sigma, sigma naught. 
So my liquid for sigma now given x bar times one period. Times one. Okay, that's fine. Uh, maybe I should have constant for the no delta actually. The one is one. Let me let me help. It's whatever this in the grant is, evaluated at theta naught. Yes. That's all we're doing. You might have said that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I said it times one because the delta is one. Okay. And I'm going to add a zero to it. So, but, okay, good. So it's just hard to hear sometimes. So our base factor for the numerator is just, um, well, we can, I'm going to get rid of the two pi's because I'm just tired of writing it down. One over sigma over root n e to the minus one half x bar minus theta naught that was like my integration step. So I have this. But you're right. That root n might not cancel as easily as you think in all your calculations. So you might want to leave it in there. Uh, good. What about the this thing right here? Remember what this is. This is going to be p x bar under the alternative. So that's just the margin of the data. So what I want is the distribution of x bar. Does anybody know what this um, integral in the denominator is? Okay, let me ask a different question. What parametric family does this distribution live in? What distribution is this? You don't need to tell me the parameters yet. It's a normal. It's a normal, thank you. I was about to quit my job. So, let me just give up. So, we talk about this sometimes, but it's a normal. We've done this integral a bunch of times. It's a completion of the square activity. <coughs> In my notes earlier, we have a whole sheet on it. So, if you want to go rewind those lectures, you could ask me at review session on Thursday to do this integral for the 17th time this year. But I think you should do it 17 times instead of me always doing it. But it's some normal. So we know it's normal. So this is going to be a density at the end of the day. So some normal distribution. Which normal? This is the question. Do you know? Where would it be centered? Where do you think it's centered? Sigma. Well, sigma naught. Centered. It's theta naught, is what you mean. But, so, yeah, the theta naught. It is. I mean, this is the only thing giving it any centering right there. It is theta naught. Do you know what the variance is? We have done this. We've done it again for posterior predictive distributions we did it done it again and again and again. The question is, is how many times do you need to do it before you remember what the answer is? I'm going to show you a trick in a second that's going to make it hard for you ever to forget ever again. You won't like my trick, but it'll make it so you can remember it. So the trick will ping people like Mohammed that I did walk in. So you know, I, I hate it. I'll tell you why he hates it in a moment. Uh, what do you think this is centered, or the variance? Yeah, let's ask um, QE takers. Alan, what would you guess? You happen to have done this for the posterior predictive calculation, right? For the normal, normal, normal posterior predictive was exactly the same. What was the variance at the end of the day? Uh, on the, okay, Olga is going to say, we are going to come over to Reagan in a second because we do have a champion. So we will go to the midterm high getter in a second. But before that, hold up. I think it's the sum of the variances and then you take the numbers. Okay, interesting. Right. It's the sum. It's the sum. Just the sum. You're trying to draw it back on a precision scale and remember our conjugate analysis that we've done. It's slightly different. It's just the sum of variances. Congratulations. So I'm infinitely impressed 
with Reagan's performance in this class. She came to me with the midterm in hand and said, all those points you took from me, I got them. So, bravo. We did get that really high score that we were hoping for. So this is just going to be sigma squared plus psi squared. That's it. So it's the variance. That's it. Uh, here's a way that I've seen this explained. This is actually in Jim's book here. Um, this is where I saw the explanation for this first. We'll look at this book in a moment. It's Jim Berger's Decision Theory book. Um, this isn't true. <laughs> this mathematical analysis is a little bit problematic. Um, but I do like it because it helped me to remember how to do this. I want the distribution on x bar. This is the distribution that I'm looking for. This is obviously true. So no Nothing up my sleeve. That's clearly true. Let's think about these piece by piece. What is this distribution, x bar minus theta? It's a normal. Centered at zero. Centered at zero. Because x bar was centered at theta. So it's subtracting off theta. Um, it's centered at zero. What's the variance? Sigma squared. So, oh yeah, over n. So, actually, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, this is a divide by n right here. So, we have a professor that messes up a lot of times. Reagan would fix that for us. She's never going to answer the question ever. <laughs> <laughs> Just very impressed by abilities. Okay, how is this distributed? Theta. Theta was normally distributed as well. Think about the prior one here. That's the distribution for theta. So theta is centered at theta naught, and it has variance psi squared. What's the distribution of two normals being added together? normal. So the sum of two normals is normal, and they're centered in the sum of the two means and the sum of the two variances. You might ask why I didn't show this to you sooner, because it's really not correct. So and the reason why is because I treated theta in very different ways right here. This is a fixed point. That's a random variable. It's a neat little mathematical remembering tool, but I wouldn't consider this correct. It does work in this case, though. So now we can't forget. So this is a normal distribution with that variance and that mean. If you'd like, you could do the iterated expectation and iterated variance to get this. That would be correct. So, but this would be a two-second tool you could pull out and get something right on the midterm if you're rushing your time. So I think we're back on track. And now we can solve everything that we need to solve. So this is our base factor that we're looking for. Same little pieces in all of this. And so our, I could have plugged in this density function, or the likelihood function as is. I would still get the same answer. At the end of the day, this is what we had worked out. That's our numerator, and here's our denominator. And I got the two pi's out of all of this. So there was a one over two pi root 2 pi that I've knocked out of the equation. And so this is almost correct. I've got the n over there as well. And so I just plugged it in. Those are, are my two marginal distributions, and I canceled out the root 2 pi. And here's, after a lot of simplification, on my notes that I made myself um, once upon a time, it took me five lines to get there. So, but these are the same. So this is the base factor, and I've just simplified it for you so that we can stare at it and think about it a little bit. Let me just um, point out, this thing right here looks awfully familiar. This is our z-score squared. So that was z-squared. That was the score that we used to be 
before, and when we're thinking about the Maven Pearsonian analysis, they only look at that. And I have argued once upon a time that as n went to infinity, if this was fixed at 1.97, I argued that the probability that theta was theta naught was 1. So I made that claim. I think I convinced most of us that was true. So if this was 1.97 and n was really, really large, dot, dot, dot from the last lecture, theta is theta naught. So it's also two standard errors away from it. So, um, Taking that space and you've made it really, really tight. Push those things right on top of each other. So this phase factor right here can just be rewritten as one plus psi squared n over sigma squared one half e to the minus one half x bar minus theta naught. Oh, sorry, this is what I want to get rid of. Z squared n and this is multiplied by this scale factor of some sort. Scale factor because it's being multiplied by it. So the Bayesian is considering more than Z. They're considering this whole thing. Okay, let's just think about this a little bit. This is our base factor. So, um, let's think about it as N goes to infinity what this whole thing does. So let's just fix a little bit of stuff. Let's just say, let's fix Zn squared at 1.97. Why 1.97? Because that's the thing you reject at. Rejection. <laughs> so over the 196 uh, barrier. So only 197 squared. Let's think about it as n goes to infinity, what this thing does. So this is a fixed number right here. So as n starts going to infinity, what does this do? Infinity. What is this doing as n goes to infinity? This whole thing's going to zero right here. So this is becoming zero. And so this whole thing is e. So 0, 1, plus 0, inverse is 1. So this looks like e to the minus 1 half zn squared times infinity. So my calculus professor would not enjoy that I just did that. So this is going to that. So this whole thing is going to infinity. So for a fixed z score 197, n goes off to infinity, we put infinite support on the null. And so let's think about how the Bayesian likes to think about this when they work on the probability scale. So our probability of h naught given x, this x bar, this is 1 plus the base factor inverted. Pi naught, pi, 1 minus pi naught over pi naught, all inverted. So this is going off to infinity right here, the base factor. So the base factor inverse is going to 0. So this thing is going to 1. Base factors inverse is going to 0 because the base factor is going to infinity. So the posterior probability just went to one. And that is at least the way I set up the argument that I think for a fixed z score of 197, if n was very, very, very large, I'd be inclined to believe that the null hypothesis is true. Very different conclusions from the two camps on this. What is it? It's that the Bayesian is thinking about their relative distance. It's calibrated by psi. That's a very different thing to think about. Let me show you the bad news in all of this. So our base factor is again 1 plus psi squared n sigma squared. Sorry, this is 1 half.
d to the minus one half c n squared one plus sigma squared over n psi squared inverted. Let's think about this as psi goes to infinity. This means that we are using the Jeffers prior when that happens. Our normal prior variance blown out into the uniform prior, which is improper over the whole continuum. So if you think about when psi goes to infinity, same thing right here. This whole term right here is going off to infinity. So psi going off to infinity, it sits right next to the n. So the same thing happens. This term is going to zero. 1 plus 0 inverse is 1 times this thing right here. So this also has the case that the base factor will be going to infinity, which yields the posterior probability on the null goes to 1. So I guess that's what troubles people in some of this that I can't use the default priors. But the question is extraordinarily different. We're asking this question, is theta theta naught? And the answer is no. But is it close enough to be theta naught that we would consider that unrejectable? And the way we think about this is very different. The Bayesian is making this a relative distance to size. So if I say you need to be infinitely far away from theta naught before I'm willing to reject it, you'll never get there. And so people have asked me for tools so that they can get their papers published. For the p-value list, go keep collecting more and more data. Eventually, you'll get a significant p-value. It won't mean anything. It's not science. But if you want to reject some goals, make that thing really big. So, or fail to reject, or even the opposite direction. I'm going to show you some good news about this. Bounds that bound this right here and what the bounds are relative to the posterior probability space. So what I want to show you next time, and we're going to pick up and walk through this analysis, but I'm going to show you a table and then we're going to come back and we're going to refer to um, Jim Berger's immense wisdom on this topic. But what we're going to do is we're going to figure out a bound on the posterior probability. I'll rewrite this for you. These are my notes from a couple of years ago that I store. But when the z-score is 1.96, I'm going to show you a bound on the posterior probability for the null. And the bound is 0.128. So what this says, and this is under some very mild conditions. I have to tell you what the conditions are. But when somebody says to me the p-value of 0.05, I usually think in my head there's at least a 13% chance of it being true. That's kind of interesting. So remember what the p-value or the alpha level are calibrating. They're errors. They're not statements about the null itself. And so when I hear 0.05, I think 13%. We'll come back around. We'll use what we just learned in this analysis and show how that works out. I think what um, Jim's conclusion to us is, is the p-value of 0.05 is just not strong evidence, but if you had to pick some p-values, just make them smaller. And that's what they came up with in their commission a couple of years ago. I was incredibly disappointed by that. So I'd say, keep doing what you're doing, <laughs> but just make it smaller. Um, less papers will get published on this. So lower error rates. Um, but we want to think about what the posterior probability is on. Um, at the end of the day, there is no reconciliation. Both sides just disagree with each other. And you'll have to decide which side is more meaningful to you. And that'll happen for a number of different reasons, and we can discuss those as well. So we'll pick up with this next time. Um, this is called the Bartlett Delinquent Paradox. It's certainly not a paradox, it's just a matter. So uh, much discussion. Once we get past all of this, um, we're going to go into model selection, but not before interval testing. I'll have a paper out on the, the web that will help guide us through interval testing. For the Bayesian, it's incredibly simple.
the way you're thinking of doing it, it's the way you do it. That's it for now. Thank you.